Okay, I think uh, we are ready to start. So I will say a couple of words in Finnish and then we we co continue. Okay, and uh, can you uh, you can hear my voice? Yeah, for you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Hei, hyvää iltapäivää kaikille ja iso kiitos, kun taas tulitte mukaan jo toiseen Tennisliiton webinaariin tänä tota, korona-aikana. Ilmoittautumisia tuli noin 65, mikä on, on taas hieno määrä, että saadaan kerättyä valmentajia ympäri Suomea yhteen. Ja tänään taas mielenkiintoinen aihe, tekninen analysointi ja observointi. Tänään keskitytään edistyneempiin pelaajiin. Toivottavasti koulutuksesta on teille hyötyä. Ja Taas kerran muistutuksena, että laittakaa mulle kehitysehdotuksia tuleviin koulutuksiin ja näihin seminaareihin liittyen. Ja muistutuksena vielä, että pistäkää teidän oma mikrofoni pois päältä seminaariajaksi, eli mute ominaisuus päälle. Ja tota, mikäli teillä on kysymyksiä kesken esityksen, niin alla löytyy allapalkki participants ja siellä on raise hand kohta. Ja sen jälkeen saatte puheenvuoron, niin laittakaa mikrofoni sen jälkeen päälle. Tehtävissä muutamissa kysymyksissä käytetään tänään chat-osioon, mikä löytyy sieltä alapalkista kanssa. Ja meidän kouluttajana tänään toimii Forias Majits Kroatiasta ja koulutuskielenä on näin ollen luonnollisesti englanti. Good afternoon for everyone. First of all, I would uh, like to wish that you are all healthy and uh, your families are too. I would like to thank you for all joining this webinar. We have today uh, around 65 coaches who put the uh, application to join to this webinar and we have also participants from russia croatia and turkey to this webinar today i wish you all warmly welcome we have today interesting topic technical analysis and observation today inside the topic we are talking about advanced players hopefully this seminar is helpful for you Feel free to give me feedback and your wishes for the upcoming seminars and coaches education. Just to remind you, put your own microphone off during the presentation. And if you have questions, press raise hand. You will find that below where are the section participants. And when you will get your turn, open your mi microphone after that. For a couple of questions during presentations, we use today chat board you will find that also below. Our educator and also Finnish Tennis Federation consult in player development and also coaches education is Foria Smajic from Croatia. From 15 years, Smajic was responsible in ITF and Tennis Europe development programs. Focus of his work was helping player development and coaches education in different tennis nations. Before that, Smajic was national junior coach in Croatian Tennis Federation and traveling coach for ITF international traveling teams. Once again, it has been great to have your help uh, for us in Finnish tennis. And uh, let's continue our development plans during the next years. Ja tosiaan mun nimi on Harri Suutarinen, Tennisliiton koulutusvastaava. And my name is Harri Suutarinen, responsible for Finnish Tennis Federation Coaches Education. With these words for you, uh, stage is yours. Thank you very much uh, for your kind words, Harry, as always. And uh, let us go straight to our uh, webinar today. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome everybody who is joining us today and our guests also from Russia and my colleagues, uh, Nick, uh, <coughs> Nick, who is uh, at the moment uh, the director of the Turkish Tennis Federation, technical director, and another colleague of mine from Croatia, who was uh, a long time a coach and a national coach, a Fed Cup coach, and a very experienced person. So I will be looking for their feedback also after this webinar too. Um, let's start first with uh, presenting our content today. So <clears throat> we will start with a very short summary of the first webinar with the key messages. Then I will go to present the framework for observing advanced players. The main part of the webinar will be focused on stroke mechanics and how to analyze the function of the strokes by the advanced players. 
I will end up with uh, some thoughts about correction and improvement, and there will be enough time for questions and discussions at the end of the seminar. So let's start. During the first part of our uh, webinar about technical analysis, we said that technique is the tool for solving tactical situations in the game. Second, improving technique should lead to more efficient game by improving shot effectiveness. And the third, code should address source of the problem and to be able to <clears throat> differentiate between the source and the consequence of the problem. At the end, last but not least, it's very important that coach agrees with, your, with the player what and why he wants to improve. So let's move on to the framework, how to look at it. Obviously, everything what we said about uh, uh, the way to observe and analyze beginning and intermediate players apply also for advanced players. But at advanced players, we have to be very specific in identifying and defining the elements of the tactical situation in which the technique breaks down. Second, we should also be able to specify the element of the stroke mechanics that needs to be improved in order to improve effectiveness. And third, Improvement is very important to be seen in a long-term perspective. Namely, when we develop, for example, the uh, serve of the 11 years old player, we have to create such a technique that he can be successful at, the, at that time, at the age of 11. It's very important for his self-confidence, but at the same time should take into account the long-term perspective and how he will be serving, perhaps even at the adult time. Because of this reason, the coach should be able to take into account the personality, body type, and actually expected game style of a player. It's very important in order to put uh, the current uh, improvements in the long-term perspective of player's development. So let's start with the first point, specifying tactical situation. The concept that I will share with you actually was presented by a very good colleague and friend of mine, Frank van Freienhoven, in 2006 during the European Coaches Conference in Stockholm. And he called it technical breaking point. There are several indicators that uh, actually indicate that uh, and tell us that player might have technical problems. The first one is that the moment when player is unable to realize his appropriate shot intention. You remember we talked about it in the previous seminar and we said that player's technical intention should be in alignment with the game situation and the, his present skill level. Second, an unintended change in player's movement caused by opponent's pressure. Actually, all of us can handle the topspin shots, but if we have to really handle the Nadal's topspin shots that has much more revolution per second, they are spinning much more, it's obviously much bigger pressure on our technique than we have with the regular one. And the moment player lose racket face control at contact can indicate very well that actually we should look at his technical skills. The elements that are defining these technical breaking points are three. The first one are incoming ball qualities or characteristics the depth, trajectory, amount of spin and speed of the incoming ball. As I just said before, in example with a spin, perhaps my technique is good by regular, but not by excess of uh, a lot of spin in the stroke. Second, speed and direction of running. I might be very good in controlling, let's say balance of my body, when I'm uh, railing in a forehand cross court with let's say one or two steps uh, returning back toward the middle, but after my down the line shot, when opponent is playing cross court with forehand, I might have problems with actually controlling the ball after running across the whole court. And outgoing ball qualities. By using the same example, when I'm running from backhand to forehand, I might be perhaps good enough to neutralize opponent's uh, attack by playing back deep to the middle, but I'm not able to counterattack with my forehand, angled forehand cross court shot. So these three elements are very important to be observed and identified by the coach 
because when we improve the technical skills, they should actually be good enough to improve effectiveness of the shot in this specific tactical situation defined by these three uh, characteristics or elements. So the effectiveness of the shot we talked about already during the first webinar. And I will not go through again, but what we will really focus on this uh, in this webinar is actually to relate our technical analysis to advanced players and actually how they develop power and spin in their strokes. Actually, power and spin in the strokes are directly related to the optimal racket speed at the contact point. And this is our criteria today, main criteria. So in order to do that, we have to be able to analyze in detail the stroke mechanics and understanding the function of the player's stroke. For this, we will actually use several biomechanical principles. The first one is the balance. Second, elastic energy. Third, momentum. Fourth, inertia and coordination chain. Now, in the following part of our webinar, actually, I will go through different examples and uh, I will try to show you the way how we can use these principles in order to analyze the advanced player's technique. So, let's start first with uh, balance. We already talked about balance in the first part and actually we talk a bit more uh, about the static balance in which actually the starter players have better control. We talk about uh, uh, wide stance and uh, vertical axis control. But today actually I would like to add and focus more on the other way of keeping balance. It's dynamic balance. And I have a few questions now for you. I, I will ask you to type in the chat your answers. So, are you ready? Hello, can you hear me again? Yes, we hear you again. Okay, yeah. I go back. So, coming back to dynamic balance. So my first question was, please type in the type of balance that, you, that we see more often in modern top game. Is it dynamic or static? Second one, second question. Which type of balance is related to powerful shots in tennis? Which, of the, which balance is related to powerful shots in tennis? Okay, third one. Now it's a tricky one. Imagine that now players are starting at the age of six to play tennis in our tennis schools. At which age do you think you actually well, we have to start to develop dynamic balance by the players. Just write the age that you actually believe is the appropriate age to start with. Okay, I will give you my answers and we will compare them later. So, which type of balance is more often to be seen in modern game? Actually, is dynamic balance because the dynamic balance is actually related to the powerful shots and the dynamic game that we see nowadays in the top tennis. When to start to develop dyna dynamic balance? Actually, players need dynamic, dynamic balance when they start to play the net immediately. They will need it by actually using the legs in order to create a leg drive. They will be already in dynamic situation by especially Involve, including the jump into the serving. So today, actually, I would like to go through development of dynamic balance as a skill by young players because I believe it's good to start to do this development as soon as possible, actually as early as possible. I see now the chat also here. 
Okay, so I'm agreeing with me too. So we can come back to this later and then we discuss the things. So now I'm moving on to actually show you a video. Foria, now we see your see your face. Okay. Yep. Now yep. We will see the video now again. Yes. Good. Just to confirm. Yeah. Okay. So during this video, I want to share with you that actually this is the way for me to start developing dynamic balance by kids. By actually, they, they should be able to connect movement of the body and actually the ball, connecting perception skills that we talk about with the ball. Basically, it's the first step in the developing good uh, dynamic uh, balance. Second, very important one is dissociation of the lower and upper body. Because this guy here has to first jump and then throw when in the air. What you, think, uh, what you see is not, not very simple for him to do. He's around six, uh, six years old now at the time when we recorded it. So please remind, uh, uh, recall this. Uh, uh, drill when we will talk about uh, leg drive by the serve later on in the webinar. Next one actually is another example of the drill with the young players to dissociate and actually control, uh, uh, create a better core control by young players moving in the different ways with the legs and upper body to actually get the feeling for this movement a different movement. Dissociation of the upper and lower body movement is a incremental for keeping the balance in the air. The last one that I'm showing you here, here is actually uh, the drill that is aiming for to actually improve the stability of uh, hips and knees by actually combining it with dynamic situation and playing with the ball. All these drills will actually help the players to control their body better in dynamic situations. And later, when they are older, we will add also medicine ball and actually start to improve this in, under, under pressure, let's say like this, uh, by juniors and advanced juniors. Another element that we need really to be aware about when we talk about dynamic balance is to observe opposite movements. Opposite movements are actually creating good stability of the trunk. And here are several examples like a kickback, how we call it by serve that we can see by Sharapo. This movement of the leg backwards and up is actually countering the forward rotation of the trunk, especially by the flat serve. By Tsonga smash from the jump, we can see how his leg is countering the acceleration of the arm and the racket uh, when hitting the ball. And below we can see Feather and Ash Barty when they are in the air trying to reach the ball and maintaining the control of, the, of their trunk axis by actually opposite movements of their free hand. I believe all of you are very familiar with this already. And uh, here I would like to also uh, focus you, or make you focus or make you aware, better to say, on one more element that perhaps sometimes is overseen and how the different stances can, for example, influence the opposite movements by playing forehand. Now we see here Feather, who is playing actually open stance forehand. With two arrows, actually, I'm pointing out the, uh, the movement and of the left leg. We can see that prior to the shot, Feather is uh, loading his right leg and the left foot is in open stand position, but actually by accelerating the arm and the racket over the contact point. He's countering this movement by moving the left leg forward. And that keeps actually the trunk stable in the air. Very often by the young players, we will not see this movement and they stay with the left leg sideways or even falling behind and losing control of the body and uh, consequently of the shot. One more thing that I would like to emphasize here is that we can see that uh, Federer's right leg is moving to the side after the contact point in order to catch the body movement and actually be able to return back to the middle. Let's compare this now with the actually the square stance movement. So in the upper row, one more time, you can observe the open stance forehand where the left front leg is moving forward in order to 
uh, enable good dynamic balance in the air. But when player uh, when Federer here is actually loading and pushing from the front leg, from his left leg, his right leg is actually moving backwards. So now he's actually keeping balance and countering the trunk rotation into the shot with his uh, right leg moving backwards. Also one more thing to be keep kept in mind when we will talk about the momentum later on. So actually here, I would like to stop talking about dynamic balance and actually, and actually uh, we will move on, move back, uh, sorry, move on to the second, uh, sec second principle uh, that we will use in analyzing the, the, the advanced uh, player's technique. So the next one is elastic energy. And elastic energy is uh, the principle that will help us in evaluating the player's preparation and if he prepared the right muscles at the right time for the shot. For this uh, principle, I will use now the ITF uh, video that was prepared in conjunction with USDA. And here I would like to thank them for enabling us to use it in uh, this uh, webinar. Emily, in this uh, videos, you will see and actually hear the explanation of each of the principles in a very short two minutes video. The muscles of the human body behave similarly to an elastic band. When they are stretched, energy is stored which can be used when the muscle returns to its original state. To make use of elastic energy, strokes should be continuous with no prolonged breaks in the swing. An example of elastic energy can be seen here in the knee bend on the serve. Feder is putting the muscles in his legs on pre-stretch, which will naturally give him more power when he is pushing up. In order to optimize elastic energy effects, research shows that a pause of less than two seconds is needed. Otherwise, the elastic energy is lost. When a top player split steps, he uses elastic energy on landing to gain a more explosive first step towards the ball. The player must land and push off quickly to optimize the elastic energy effect. Elastic energy is also stored in the trunk when it is rotated on the take back. Players then use the naturally stored elastic energy to rotate forward into the shot, but now with more power and efficiency. In the example of the take back, Coaches can foster elastic energy in their players by simply ensuring that they rotate their shoulders back more than their hips. This puts the muscles of the trunk on stretch, which will provide elastic energy to enhance the stroke. Please read these key messages. Okay, I'll stop sharing this one. And uh, now going back to my PowerPoint, what will appear in a second. And we move on. Okay. So, actually, now after listening this uh, short video, I would like you to test uh, the at least uh, the information that you have here. And now by observing the feathers serve in these four sequences of, the, of his movement, in the next minute or two maximum, I will ask you to identify by each of these frame, which of the muscles has actually feather pre-stretch in which of the muscles he's storing elastic energy. I give you now, one minute, two minutes to find actually the muscles to identify them and lay them for yourself. Write it for down for yourself on the paper.
Harry, can you please tell me when you are able to do that? Yes, I will say when I'm ready. Yes. Yes, ready here. Okay, I will share with you now my own actually uh, ideas observations. So, in the first frame, by actually bringing his left arm up and uh, rotating the shoulders backwards, actually Feather is storing elastic energy in his trunk, actually abdominal muscles in the so-called oblique and the straight abdominal muscles here. At the same time, by bringing the body down and uh, bending the legs, he's pre-stretching his upper and lower legs muscles too in both legs. By the second frame, when he actually drive up and his racket at the same time is falling back. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. And his uh, racket is falling back behind his uh, uh, right shoulder. Feather is pre-stretching his chest and front part of the shoulder muscles. Here I want you to really be aware that his racket is away from the body, what very often contradicts with the coach's advice to scratch the back with a racket. Actually, when the racket is scratching the back, you cannot optimally prepare the chest and shoulder muscles. It's crucial because this movement of the upper arm, it's called the internal rotation, is actually responsible, or better to say, contribute with around 40% of the racket speed at the contact point. And it's one of the key elements of the successful serve. The next frame, when Feather is accelerating his elbow upwards, he's going to stretch his forearm muscles. And in the last frame, you can see that just prior to the last movement of the racket to, toward the, the ball, when he's actually accelerating the re, uh, wrist up, he's pre-stretching the wrist uh, muscles also that will actually create so-called racket snap or wrist snap. And that's also added around 30% of the racket speed at the contact point. So these are very important elements in order to create optimal racket speed. The base for this uh, or precondition, better to say, for the ability to use the elastic energy during the movement toward the ball is actually that the player has loose muscles. If he is tight, obviously he will not be able to achieve this in, in the shot. So put it all together, in order to use this principle optimally and to store and use the elastic energy to improve the, the shot efficiency, actually the player should have a minimal pause at the end of the backswing, that would be around 0 0.2 second maximum between the record go back and start to move forward again. Magnitude of the stretch should be comfortable speed of the stretch relatively fast and the key is loose muscles very tight he will not be able to actually stretch his muscle and store the elastic energy one more thing i would like to stress here is and i'm very often asked by the coaches during the courses okay correct but uh, how much we should actually emphasize it with the young kids compared to the pros even though players are individually different, there are some, I would call it common guidelines. At the age of the 11, like we see the guy here on the left, we expect that he's able to use it around 50% uh, of this uh, stored energy or energy that can be stored. And by rotating the shoulders more than the hips for around five to 10 degrees, by being 15 years old and being competitive player, we expect that they are able to use around 80% of elastic energy by bringing the shoulder axis for 10 to 15 degrees more backward compared to the hips. Yeah, and by the pros, 
they are able to rotate the shoulders up to 30 degrees more than the hips in order to create even more elastic energy. One more time, elastic energy as a principle is giving us a criteria and helping us to, uh, to analyze the player's pre preparation and if they pre prepare the right muscles or the need muscles needed for the shot at the right time and in the right order. The next principle that we will talk about is momentum. Momentum is actually helping us to evaluate how player is developing and produce the energy during the hitting phase of the stroke. And here we will go back to the next uh, video. Stop sharing this with you and go to the next video. Okay, now it's very important that I go to the right video. I hope everything works well. Momentum is defined as the quantity of motion of a moving body, measured as a product of its mass and velocity. The greater the mass of an object, the more momentum. There are two types of momentum. These are linear momentum and angular momentum. Linear momentum refers to momentum in a straight line. A good example of this can be seen in a sliced backhand, where the racket moves forward in a more linear fashion. Stepping into the ball is another example of a linear momentum, which can be seen here by the player on screen. Angular momentum refers to momentum in a circular motion. A stroke with plenty of angular momentum present can be seen here in the semi-open stance forehand. Linear and angular momentum should not be considered isolated from each other. In tennis, both occur in all strokes to some degree. Linear is simply transferring body weight forward in the direction you are hitting, whilst angular momentum is produced from the body rotation occurring at the hips and trunk. This read these key messages also. Okay, now the information that you have here, the explanation about the linear and angular momentum, I would like you to test by observing now two young players, younger players, the two ladies. And in the, in the first video, I will ask you to observe how they transfer the linear momentum into the shot. We will do that in the following way. I will show you the video in the regular speed, and after that, I will go backwards, I will come back, and I will show you again, frame by frame, actually two shots, so that you can analyze and make your mind and decision. So try to, uh, first of all, say to yourself, if you are happy with the way how they translate the, uh, translate the momentum or use the linear momentum in the shot, but please focus on linear momentum. And second, what you would do in order to improve it. Let's move on. Okay, think about, I'm going backwards. I will now show you actually in slow motion in a even frame by frame.
Okay. I give you now one minute. Harry, again, inform me when you did your own observation and decision. So if you are happy or not, and if you are not happy, what you would like to improve by this player? Yes, I will tell you when I'm ready. Okay. Yes, ready here. Okay, let's then do it together. Now, please observe actually the young lady's now movement. At this moment, when she start to accelerate the racket forward and actually moving to the ball in order to translate the energy and they should use the linear momentum correctly and efficiently, actually the body with the, together with the center of the uh, of the gravity and the hips should move to the to, to the ball now when you observe what she is doing basically here look at these two frames she's pulling the left leg forward and at the same time extend her right knee basically moving the hips backwards I believe that very many of you have actually noticed that her head is going down and actually she's leaning with the trunk forward. But here I would say that's a very good example of sometimes hidden sources of the problem. Because for me, the trunk and, and, uh, and the head is actually just this opposite movement inside the body in order to keep the balance. But the problem for her is that actually she starts instead of pushing, pushing the left hip forward, she's actually pulling her left leg forward and extending backwards her right leg. So obviously she cannot use her body weight in the contact point efficiently or optimal. So let's see the last one, just to confirm, yeah. With this video, I would like you also to motivate, to look at the slow motion videos, analyze, and don't believe in, in actually what you see with your eyes always on the court, because sometimes such details are hidden and not easy to recognize on the court. Now we are coming to the second one. It's angular momentum, and let's do it in the same way. You observe now another player, and you, you focus on actually using the angular momentum in the back and shot. Oh, sorry. No, oh, <laughs> I forgot. Uh, actually, before one thing that I want to ask, the question is, do player, players when hitting open sense forehand apply linear momentum? Ask yourself and give yourself a quick answer. Yes or no? Actually, I hope everybody said yes, because at open stance, the players are using linear momentum, but they're in a vertical direction. So one thing that I want also to emphasize here is that linear momentum can be horizontal, by let's say making step in into the ball, and by open stance, it will be more in the vertical direction, like by the serve also. So the correct answer is yes. Now let's move on to angular momentum and observing the second player. Again, you can see it in the regular speed. Okay, I will bring it back. And we'll let you see now one movement in the slow motion. We're focusing on creating and using angular momentum in order to accelerate the record. One more time.
Okay. Harry, let me know when you made your decision and uh, have your answers. Yes, ready here. Already ready. Okay, I give just 10 seconds more for the others that were perhaps not uh, so quick as you are. Okay, I hope you have your answers. And now I will go through this movement and try to analyze by myself for you. So, praise using this also stepping in technique. And here, and there is something what I would like you really to be aware about. Again, this player also is not really pushing into the shot with left leg. What you could see is that she is actually pulling during the shot her knee forward. So I will go, just take a look and I will go to one actually slide that I prepare for you. So at this slide now, you can see the comparison, you can compare uh, Caroline Wozniacki, how she actually create and uh, the angular momentum and combine it with a stepping in compared to this girl that we were just observing. And here with, here with, I would like to use this opportunity to address one thing that is very fashionable nowadays. We hear it uh, by very many moderators, uh, also in TV and coaches like to use hip rotation. Hip rotation actually happens when you push from the back leg and basically bring the dominant hip for the right hand, and now for the forehand is the right hip forward to catch up with the left hip and then move together to, to toward the toward the ball. Very often, this is misinterpreted by actually bringing the legs around to rotating the hips with the legs. At that moment, what is happening is again like an opposite movement. You bring your you pull your leg uh, and knee forward. And that also brings on the other side that your trunk is also leaned forward. And the main part of your body where it is your weight actually is not moving during the contact into the shot. Because of that, it's very important to understand that by initiating and really pushing the hips forward, we create the stable base for the upper trunk, for the trunk to be able to rotate into the, uh, into the shot and in the contact point. So please be aware about uh, this when you are analyzing angular momentum and also when you are talking about the hip and shoulder rotations. Be aware how the rotation is produced and how to observe if it is efficiently created by the player and used by the player. So to end up about momentum, I want to go back and actually just remind you that momentum is the principle that is helping us to evaluate how player has produced the energy during the hitting phase of the stroke. Okay, now I stop sharing this and I will go to another video that will in introduce us to the next, uh, the next principle and that will be inertia. So the next uh, biomechanical principle that help us in understanding and analyzing player stroke is principle of inertia that is helping us to understand acceleration and deceleration of the uh, in the movement and the racket. <laughs> The law of inertia states that a body will stay at rest or continue to move in the same direction until acted upon by an outside force. Taking the ready position as an example, the player here has a certain amount of resting inertia whilst standing still. 
He must overcome that resting inertia by using opposite force, otherwise he will not move. When coaches talk about inertia, they talk about overcoming it. Inertia also helps us to understand the ability to make a change of direction quickly. Overcoming inertia is more difficult for players of a greater mass. This is why changing direction is more difficult for taller players. To illustrate this concept, think about the difficulty of stopping a moving bowling ball when compared to a ping pong ball. The lighter one is much easier to stop and return. Inertia is also relevant during stroke production itself. Using the forehand as an example, most pros perform the forehand with the arm slightly bent throughout. When hitting with a slightly bent arm, there is a smaller moment of inertia than when hitting with a straight arm. This simply means that there is less resistance to rotation and hence more racket head speed can be generated. Having the arm bent and close to the body can make it much easier to swing the racket faster in the case of the forehand. And therefore, coaches should teach players to hit with the racket arm slightly bent, particularly when teaching females or young juniors with less physical strength. Maybe. And here I would like also to emphasize what he said at the end and look at the last point that it doesn't mean that you should not by for example that by forehand have not to, to have straight arm at a contact point. This is not what you want to say. It's about having bent elbow and arm during the acceleration the phase of the stroke. Okay, so let's take a look a little bit in this uh, moment, uh, principle of inertia and uh, how we can use it in order to select perhaps the optimal style for a player. So the stroke that I will use is actually the serve. And there is a question that many coaches are question, uh, facing to actually uh, decide or to choose either foot up or foot back serving style. So foot back is the one when the where he's keeping his back foot behind and then go to jump from that position or bringing the back foot close to the front and then accelerate. We know that uh, from the research that foot back style is actually more efficient in producing the movement forward into the, into the court and actually with foot back we can reach the higher position and the contact point. Nevertheless, now this is also the opportunity to show how by understanding by mechanical principles we can also take into account the player's body type his abilities by actually picking up the let's say uh, choosing the right technique for a player either and when we are using foot up or foot back uh, footwork, uh, footwork style the balls should produce the same movement of the hip and trunk so first the player has to accelerate his dominant hip for the right hand is the right one up of upward so to go first up and then rotate into the shot so now by taking into account what we have just heard in the video actually if we consider that the right leg the back leg here is like a weight it's much easier to rotate it forward if you bring that mass closer to the vertical axis of rotation. When it is actually very important. It's important especially when we talk about younger advanced players between 11, 13, 14, when they are growing and very often the, the, their muscle strength, especially explosive power, is not good enough to actually accelerate this long leg actually forward, uh, up and forward in the right way. At that time, understanding this uh, principle of, in, of inertia can help us to choose between the fo footwork techniques, foot back or foot up. Actually, if the player is strong enough, he can pick either of them. 
but if he has, let's say, tiny legs with not enough power, of course, foot top techniques would be easier for him to apply. Here with, I would also like to share with you one of my personal experience with one top player. It's a Marin Ciric that you see here at the screen. And at the age of 18, just after he actually won the junior Roland Garros, his coach asked me to take a look together with him in Marin's serve. And uh, he asked me also which uh, footwork style I would actually recommend for him. I asked uh, Marin to try a few serves from foot back and foot up uh, style, and uh, he was able to do both of them easily, no problem for him. And uh, I actually asked him which one you, you really preferred. And then he said, foot back. I said, why? He said, well, I just feel better. And here I want to also say one very important thing, that my mechanics is very important for us as a coaches. But first of all, player should feel good with his own technique. If he doesn't feel good, if we impose on him something, it's a great source of excuses when the things get rough during the match. So here we see also that uh, actually Marin was preferring the footback style and we can see that he's using excessive leg drive and leaning back of the body because he was looking for enough, let's say, acceleration. I can tell you that it was obvious that for him, let's say, foot, foot up would be working much better in terms of mechanics, but he was quite stubborn. He kept his style and the coach was not really able to convince him. But interestingly, you can see on the right side of the screen now, when uh, Marin was starting to work with uh, Goran Ivanishevich, he just told him that actually he has to make it, uh, his foot uh, back closer to actually narrow his base and lean less backwards. With these small adjustments, he found the style where he used still the foot back technique, but in the way that is appropriate for his body type and actually improved the consistency of Marin's serving immensely. And that was one of the elements that brought him to be able to win the US Open several years ago. So here we, I would like to emphasize one more time that this principle like uh, principle of inertia can help us to understand better how to adjust the, uh, the, the principle and technique of a player to suit his own personal style, playing style, body type, and personality. So let's move on to the next one. And the next, actually, the last uh, principle that we will use in analyzing the players will be the principle of coordination chain. Now we will stop sharing the screen again, and I will bring the last The last uh, video for you with the explanation of my colleague from ITF. What is the principle of coordination chain and how we can observe it in tennis strokes? The coordination chain involves all the segments of the body acting together at the right time. The force generated by one link of the chain or body part is transferred in succession to the next link. Coaches who refer to timing and rhythm are often referring to the principle of the body's coordination chain. The stroke begins with the eyes on the ball followed by the rotation of the upper torso. This should be the first part of the backswing and is key for early preparation. Once in position, the stroke must begin from the legs up. Power is then transferred from the legs to the hip and into the trunk and is then transferred through to the arms and shoulder. And finally, the elbow and wrist.
Taking a look at the stroke again, you will see the chain of body parts that are essential for a well-timed stroke. Okay, so now actually you, I hope you can recall that the moderator was mentioning timing and rhythm that coaches are bringing together with this uh, actually the biomechanical principle, principle of coordination chain. As we also use these two terms in our first webinar, I would like to be sure that actually everybody can differentiate how to use these two things in his observation. And for this, I will use the example of dancing. Yeah, when you look at this guy, I believe you will agree that he has a great rhythm. With his feet, he can make an uh, unbelievable thing, yeah? But in order to uh, actually dance with a partner, you need also time. So now timing means that you are able to actually align your body movement with the object outside of the body. But the partner dance is with your partner, but in tennis we don't have a partner on the other side, but we have a ball. So we have to align the movement of the body segments with an incoming ball. And then we are talking about timing. When we talk about moving the segments apart from the ball, we can talk about a rhythm. So, we will use this uh, principle, principle of uh, coordination chain, in actually analyzing the efficiency of the leg drive by sir. So now let's take a look in this uh, slide and two photos that you can see here. On the left side, you can see so-called push serve, and on the right side, so-called pull serve. By taking a closer look, it's easier to understand that uh, it's easy to understand that basically by the push serve, the players are able to transfer the energy from the ground to the feet and the racket in almost like a straight line. By pull serve, we see this energy line, let's call it like this, broken, and obviously that uh, um, transfer of the energy throughout the body is not optimal. I believe you saw this position by very many of the young players or very often by the young players. And in my opinion, there are two key reasons when you talk about uh, coordination chain that can lead to such problems. Apart from this, for sure, that the core strengths uh, actually and core control can be another element that can be the reason for this. So let's take a look first into the extensive hip thrust as a reason for pull, pulling surf. So by observing these two players, you can see that by Federer, his uh, front hip actually is inside the base of the support, what enable him also to load his back leg optimally. On the other side, on the right side of the screen, you can see the lady that actually brought her left hip outside of the base of the support. She's not really loading her right leg in the optimal way. And let's take a look how it actually reflects on the, uh, of the moving of the body by her serve. So, yeah, it will come very quickly to this uh, loading position. And here I would like you now to be aware that her right hip, when she tossed the ball, is here. And now what is happening when she is actually driving up with the legs. Actually, her hips are moving backwards and she's rotating the body, actually twisting around without moving forward. By contact point, actually her, her, uh, her hip is almost like a 40 centimeters further away from the ball than it was before the start of the leg drive. And the consequence of this is a pulling serve with landing exactly at the same place where she was starting. 
I believe that we all agree that actually this is not the optimal way to transfer the energy throughout the body. Because of that, I will bring it back. And I want you to realize that extensive hip thrust, when the players are moving the hips too far in front, actually will create a position of the body by which is almost impossible to optimally transfer the energy in uh, toward the ball up and forward. I will go very quickly one more time. Because if she's jumping, but not jumping into the ball, she's staying at the, the same place and obviously doesn't use the whole potential that he has that she has. Coordination of the movement of the hips and shoulders, actually leg drive that is transferred through hips to the shoulders is another uh, common challenge for the young players. And let us have a quick look here. You remember this uh, first photo on the left with Djokovic in which we have already said that the first element of the leg drive is to drive the dominant hip up and after that forward hips and trunk. On the right side of the screen, we see a young player around 11 years old, and you can see that she's, by not being actually or in the air at all, she already rotates the hips and shoulders in, into the shot. And it's obvious that it will end up with so-called pulling serve instead of pushing serve. In order to make it more visual, I will also show one very short video clip here. Where now you can observe the player's hip, right hip, and right shoulder, how they move. Hip and shoulder are almost aligned. And now when the player is moving upward, at the same time when she is moving up, hips and shoulders are moving together also forward. So she's not doing like Djokovic is doing, to go first up and then rotate. She goes at the same time with hips and shoulders forward when she is extending the legs. It's interesting to actually think about why so many players develop this or having this uh, challenge in their serving technique. Uh, number one thing that I would like to offer you as a, as a reason why is because we all, also me, myself, are starting to teach the kids to serve without jumping. Of course, because it's easier. So if you don't serve, if you don't jump into the serve, then basically you, you start your acceleration from the shoulder, not from the legs. And now if the kids cannot actually dissociate these two movements, actually they don't have a movement pattern that they can use for serving with a jump because they have to first be able to jump first and then rotate forward, jump and then throw. You remember the video that I showed you at the beginning? when the young kid was jumping on the trampoline and it was not easy for him. He was actually not able to jump and then at the, at the peak point in the jump to throw the ball. He was trying to do it at the same time. So basically what I want to say with this is that Fast. if the player doesn't have this skill, actually it's better not to ask him to use the jump into the serve. So one drill that I can offer you to think about like an idea is look at this guy. Now he's jumping, his uh, right uh, shoulder is behind him. And then when he actually stretch his legs, he is now moving forward and throw the ball. Look at this, the second guy. He's almost too much, of course, rotating the hips here. He will not be able to really jump. And what he's doing is he's actually just throwing from the shoulder by rotating the, the trunk and move on. The third guy is jumping, but look at now at his right hip and shoulder. He's jumping and his right shoulder is moving already forward, exactly like what we saw by the, by the girl. So, He's ending up also by pulling and bringing his actually whole right side of the body forward 
not in the very coordinated manner, let's say like this. So by taking a look in the real speed or the normal speed, one that is doing this really well, one that is not jumping almost at all with the back foot, and the last one. So I would like to end up this video by saying that without developing this movement pattern, the skill is better to wait before we ask players to include it in their jumping serve, because with the racket and the ball and all this, it's even more de demanding than actually just uh, uh, just with uh, throwing the ball. So, one more time, coordination chain will help us in evaluating development of the racket speed and trans uh, and uh, transferring of the energy through the coordination chain in the stroke. We end up with all these five principles in analysis and I would like to put some ending thoughts by talking a little bit about correction and improvement of tennis technique. Personally, I believe if I have to, if I have to correct a lot, then something I did wrong before. Correction is actually something what we think is negative. Optimally would be that we are making a continuous improvement of player's technique. And uh, for this, actually, I would like to share with you the thoughts of one very uh, famous artist. His name is Michelangelo. Namely, when he was asked, how do you create the sculptures from the stone? He said, I don't create the sculptures. The sculptures are already in the stone. What I do, I just take away what is not necessary, what is too much. So how to transfer it actually in our perhaps coaching? For me, if player apply pro appropriate tactical intention in his strokes and is relaxed with loose muscles during the stroke, he will be in position to intuitively and naturally, let's say, find efficient technique. By observing biomechanical principles, coach will be able to improve and optimize player's technique according or taking into account his body type and playing style. With this closing thought, I would like to thank you for your attention and actually open the time for your questions and that we create some discussions even better. Thank you very much. Hari, please take over.